Welcome everybody, in this video we're gonna cover the prototype design pattern. It is quite a niche design pattern, I have personally never had a situation where I needed to use it so you might never end up in this situation yourself. It is still a very powerful design pattern and we're gonna go over a real world example where it really shines and I think it's important to be aware of what it is and when you need to apply it. The whole thing about the prototype design pattern is the actual prototype in the prototype design pattern. What does it refer to? It refers to instances of implementation of a interface or some kind of abstract class that implement a copy method. So in our case, I have seeds and then I have trees, grasses, uh, grass seeds and flower seeds, right? So eventually they will emerge into their own objects, but we're kind of having these seeds. And if you think about any like procedurally generated video games, perhaps like Minecraft, if we have some kind of seed and then the whole thing like flourishes into it, 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 its own map, essentially. But the whole point here is we give it some kind of seed and then from that seed, we're able to copy it and have those same instances. So we essentially configure what we want to be creating at runtime. That's the main difference between the factory pattern where kind of like at compile time, we decide what we want to create. Sure, we can pass some parameters, although it is not quite as powerful as the prototype pattern. So let's see uh, the two main ways that we can use it. The first one is really just having your application compose of these prototypes. And it really depends on what your, what your application does. And we'll, we're going to take a look at it uh, at the real world example where you're going to understand a little bit more. But another way that might be a little bit more digestible at the moment is, for example, if we have a factory and this factory may implement some kind of interface. And if you have a big hierarchy of objects that you may want to have your factory class create, instead of creating the identical amount of factories that could possibly, possibly create all types of combinations of all the gardens that you want, you can simply supply the prototypes into the factory and then your factory is going to spit out the appropriate seeds, right? So from uh, green grass, we can supply the red grass and, you know, it changes there. Obviously, this can be a parameter on the create plant function, but let's say we want to substitute a whole class. We're not creating a different factory. We are just essentially supplying a different configuration into the factory for it to create. So hopefully that makes sense. The main takeaway that I want you to have is this copy method. The prototype should know how to clone itself into a new instance. And the main thing that you want to break are any object references. So the object that you copy from, so if the tree seed, if you want to clone it, if you want to copy it, if you have any object references, you do not want to have the two object references pointing to the same object. You will have to clone those object references as well. Okay, so make sure that they are real copies and the whole internal structure of it is copied as well. So they don't corrupt each other's state, right? Now, uh, the real world example that we're going to take a look at is Excel, the one and only the immortal, right? So here we have it, a bunch of cells lined up together in a grid. Where are the prototypes? What I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly type in hello world and we're going to analyze how this works. So here I have a, a piece of text. It's a string. I'm going to press enter and then Excel is just going to put it in a cell. All right. So I'll widen this out a little bit so we can see kind of like a difference here. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to type in another string, but it's numbers. And uh, you can see already there is a slight different get, a difference. It gets aligned to the right rather than the left. I don't know the significance of it, but there it is. Um, and let's take another one, which is the date. So we're just going to say 01, 01, 2000. So this one gets aligned to the right as well. And if you ever used Excel, you're going to know there are going to be some contextual differences. For example, the word, I cannot move any decimal places or anything like that. With the numbers, I can and with the date, I cannot. So some actions apply to some cells and some don't. When we have some kind of value in the word, it's not just text. There's a lot of other metadata about the cell that sort of defines it, right? So let's just copy the cell. We'll paste it down here, right? So we've cloned the cell. We can now make this cell bold. We can copy it and we paste it. You can see that the boldness of the text gets copied as well without it really affecting the previous cell. So each individual cell in this case is a prototype. So you can see how we can change the content in one cell. We can copy it and that identical cell gets spawned. So in our case, 
each individual cell is an implementation of the seed. And here I have an example of how that represents it. So let's see how we can further have some of these differences between the cell and how each individual cell functions. So, uh, and how they basically can be different ex implementations. And what I mean by that is essentially we have a text cell, we have a number cell where if we do something incre increase decimal, so you can see the zero pops up here, but if we perform it on this action, uh, sorry, on this cell, nothing happens, right? So there is some kind of difference between these two cells. And I'm just going to say that I can apply a different class. Uh, I can put these values in different classes. So this would be like a text block. This is a number block and this is a date block. And again, if I in increment the decimal here, nothing happens. Although what I can do for the date time format is if I copy it and I put it here and it may be actually a little better if I do something like this. So 06, let's delete this, put the 06 here. And if I right click and number a uh, number format, I don't know what it's called number format, but what I can essentially do is change the format of the date. And again, make it something like bold. And you can see again, all the state in the cell, the cell knows everything about itself can be copied into a different cell. So a cell is a prototype, it has a copy method, and we can just place it in any other cell. Let's take a look at how this may be implemented. This is not a one to one implementation of Excel, there is no interface, we are going to be scripting our interaction with it. So uh, just take this with a grain of salt. And this is my interpretation of how Excel works. So the first step that we really have is we just have a list of uh, blocks, right? Not a grid, we have a list. And uh, then I have the block factory. So I equate this to the action of we type something in, we press enter. And at that point, the factory runs and gives us some kind of element. So in our case, the element that I refer to or the, or the class of the block, we essentially put the content in it. And then we say, try to parse out the date time. And here you can see I am hard coding the format. And this is actually a problem Excel has as well. So for example, if I have something like date, uh, let's say day 20, 06 and uh, 2021, it's aligned to the right, it recognizes it as a, the date. If I do 06, uh, 20, 2021, it aligns it to the left. It doesn't recognize it as a date because the default date time format that Excel uses is the European one that I'm in, right? So I'm kind of hard coding it here. There are things that I can do to kind of make this better, but uh, never mind that. The point is, we try to parse some date time out of the content. We remove, we return a date time block. If we try to parse out the number, if that's successful, we return a number block. And then we have a text block, which we just rate if we can't do any of the previous two operations, right? So at the end, when we do block factory create with some content, uh, we essentially get some kind of a block out, out of it. Now the iBlock interface implement need to implement two things. The clone function, which is specific to the prototype pattern. I want my blocks to copy their state into this new block. And the render function is Excel specific because it doesn't matter what's behind, uh, what's inside the block, it's going to get rendered to a text. Okay. So that's the thinking behind that. Then there is the text block. So that implements the iBlock. It just has content. And when it clones, it just creates a new text block and uh, re just renders the content. For the number, we, I mean, just super simple, the number, we two string the number and we render it, right? So there is no bold, no font, uh, no italics on the text, nothing like that, right? Uh, imagine that the render function kind of takes care of that and the state of the text being bold and whatnot, the styling of the text lives on the block as well and gets copied along whenever we call the clone function. A uh, date time block contains the date time and the format. So when we date time to string and trigger the format, uh, that's what happens, right? Uh, let's go ahead and perform an Excel operation like copying the date block to a new cell. So for me, this would be an equivalent of grabbing this date and pasting it here. And I guess it's kind of worth thinking about where does the cloning operation occur? Let's say we select the date, we press control copy, we load the reference to the cell into the clipboard. And when we paste, because we can paste the same thing every single time, every time we paste, that is when the clone gets called and we get a fresh object every time we paste because we're pointing to the original cell from the clipboard. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is grab the third element. So the date for me, this will be grid two. I'm just going to go ahead and clone this. And at the end of them, I'm going to convert it to a date time block. So I'll just grab this class and just call it block three. 
I will change the date time format. The original one is the European one. So let me just go ahead and say something like format equals month, date, date, year, year, year. And then let's just take the grid. I'm going to add block three back into it. And we can go ahead and dump out the grid again and display. So this would be a similar operation to how we would grab a value from a cell, clone it into the new position within the grid, and then change some kind of value inside of it. And now it has a uh, the same date, although different rep representation. And if I'm really doing a, a real copy of Excel, I would be having the text styling in here as well uh, as the default cloning operation and stuff like that. And we can obviously take this further by now copying the third block. Let's say we grab this third one, we create the fourth one. Instead of this, we take date time EDC now, and we assign that to the date. We add the fourth block and we redump the grid. Just gonna delete this so you can actually see it. And you can see at the end, we end up with the American date time format, although for the date that we have today. So again, I copied the previous block. I'm able to reuse everything, all the information that it was currently holding for the new block that I'm creating. This is uh, pretty much all there is to the prototype design pattern, just the clone function and understand that you can use it to configure other classes on what they should return instead of just creating a new subclasses. So it can really reduce the amount of classes that you have in your code base by just basically giving your other classes prototypes on what it should return and understand that they can be configured at runtime as well. Whoa, hold up. Look. This is the stuff I used to torture myself on the weekends. Now, it takes time to digest this and package it up into these videos. So if you did enjoy the content, please like, subscribe if you want to see more, uh, leave a comment if you have any questions. And if you want to be part of the community that I'm building, make sure to join my Discord server. I also stream on Twitch Wednesdays and Sundays, 6 o'clock London time. I have also opened up a merch store. So if you do want to support me, don't just donate, buy from there. Links to all of that and my other social media are in the description. Hope to see you again and have a good day.